everybody. Hello, hello. How's everybody doing tonight? We hope you're having an amazing evening. We thank you for tuning in to our Overcomer event, The Weight. It's going to be an exciting night, Chris. There's going to be a lot yes. of yes. We think we're going to help people. So, yes. Hey, everybody. My name is Chris Swataco, and this is my amazing friend, Corey, Corey Nichols. Nichols. You go ahead. You say it. <laughs> Corey Nichols. And uh, I love it how when, when you have the, the words at the bottom, Corey, it always spells my name weird, strange. And uh, and so does yours, does it sometimes misspell your name as well? Nope. nope. <laughs> that I think not that's technology. Fair. That is not fair. That is not fair. Well, you know, uh, we're waiting for some people to come on live. We've got a few. Here they come. I'm starting to see the numbers increase. And, um, and please uh, share. Yeah share this so that other people can join us as well and watch there's miss terry davis hi terry glad to have you join us and uh yeah share it with your friends and um so we are excited to be we haven't we haven't done this in a little while have we we haven't we've been off for a couple months and it's it's actually been a nice we thank you for tuning we're in excited to be to back for cummer event we're, we're excited to be back on i heard an echo Chris, yes, you did because when I shared it on another page, um, it what the sound was up, and so yeah. that's the the limitations of the or the the uh, the challenge of Facebook Live yeah. and uh, and Zoom and all that, trying to get everything to be coordinated. And so yeah, we we I was in Europe for several weeks, and um and so we could not do anything from Europe. And I think you've been traveling too with Destiny. Traveling Red. like crazy. Yep. Yep. And so, but we love this whole series on Overcomer. And, and I believe you have a book similar to this topic that's coming out. Um, why don't you share with that while we wait for folks to get on? You no, know, I, thank you, Chris. I do. I have a book, my first book. It's, it's exciting. It was a scary step of faith, but um, I've seen God's hand on the whole thing. And I couldn't be more excited. It's called More. God is not done with you. And I really believe there's a lot of people, Christians, that are stuck in life. They they don't understand why they've gone through what they've gone through, or maybe they've gone through failure and things they can't forgive themselves, or they feel full of shame and guilt for the things that they've done in their past. And they're, they are relegating themselves to a second rate life when Christ died, that they could be free and that the mistakes that they've done in God's hand can be stepping stones uh, to a greater future. And those things can be nuggets of wisdom that we yeah. can use to impart to other people who need to know that there's a God in heaven that loves cracked pots, broken people, that um, when you give God those things, he can do something extraordinary with your life yeah. and to help others find and discover the God of mercy and grace. And so that's what the book's about. Um, it's going to be out after the first of the year. We're in the final edits of it. And so please pray for me, uh, the right the right path forward for it to get published and uh, to be available to people. But I can't wait. Well, you know, years ago, um, I, I had a season in my life and I wrote a, a conference called Something More. And that whole year, I taught it everywhere. And it was the same concept of people wanting more, but not knowing how to get there and saying, oh, I want this in my life. I want to have a better job. I want to have a thinner waist. I want to, I want to get along with my kids more. And yet they couldn't seem to get there. And so God gave me this incredible message. And I went around that whole year trying to just help people get get past, you know, get to that next place. Not that I have the solutions for everything, but I had managed to make it, you know, I had managed to make some changes in my life and move. And so, and that's all what God uses all of us for, right, Corey? Uh, yes. you know, everyone that's watching this and will be watching this has a story where God has done something in your life, but there's sometimes we have to wait, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Sometimes which we is, have to wait. Is we have to wait. And I, not all of us are great waiters. I, I no, would be no. like, I was not born a great waiter. I am anything but patient. Um, this yes. quality has had to be worked out in my life 
and worked out in my life and worked out in my life. And, you know, um, well, you know, I'm what, I'm I, I want to hear and please put in the chat if you're watching this, where you're watching it from, put your name in. Um, again, I'm Chris Wataka with the Singles Network Ministries and Chris Wataka Ministries and Intentional Relationship Solutions. And this is my good friend, Corey Nichols with Corey Nichols Ministries. I have a passion to help people know God, find lasting freedom in Christ, and discover their God given purpose that you, you know your why. Why were you put here on this earth? And we yeah. want to help equip people to do that. So, so while yeah. you guys are putting in your information, let me get us started with some prayer. And then we're going to talk about the fun word, wait. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you. We praise you. You are our God. You have taught us and continue to teach us your word. And you've taught us about waiting. There are people in the Bible that had to wait. And there's a value to this waiting. But boy, it's not fun. So, Lord, help us to look as we listen tonight. Help each one that's watching this would think about their own life. Where they struggle with waiting? What is the reason they struggle? Where have they seen God in that way? And what is God trying to do? So, Lord, I pray for Corey. I pray as you speak through him, Lord, that you would give him your mighty word to say. And as both of us would decrease and you would increase, we pray and ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen, Chris. Yes. So Corey, what do you, you know, what and people, we want you to put it in the chat too. What are some ways you do not like to wait or cir circumstances you don't like to wait in? Well, I live in a very big city, Atlanta, Georgia, some of the worst traffic in the nation. And so I do not like waiting in traffic, especially if I'm, if I have to be somewhere at a certain time and I can just feel like I'm going to be late because it's in, you're in gridlock traffic. doesn't matter which way you turn, you're not getting anywhere. I, I've literally been in Atlanta traffic, li literally moved two stoplights that were like a hundred feet from each other in two hours, yeah. in yeah. two hours. Like you just, you couldn't move. And I yeah. could just feel myself getting frustrated and been out of shape. I'm just spending an unbelievable amount of time in the car. And um, God's had to really teach me patience in those. Well, Corey, do you think it's worse when you're, when you're running late, you've got to be yeah. somewhere else. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you don't give yourself plenty of time, like anymore, like I know I'm always checking the, the beautiful thing about today. You got these smartphones that have these apps that let you see about approximately how long it's going to take you to get there in yeah. real time. And so I'm always checking that and I'm always leaving early enough to compensate traffic. Although there are times if there's like an accident or something that can just yeah. throw that, that time out of sorts for sure. So my mom thinks it's hysterical that I put the GPS on to, to drive 20 miles. And, and the reason why is not that I don't know how to get there. It's just that if there is an accident, yep. um, it'll send you in a different direction. And you don't know there's an accident unless you have your GPS on. Um, oh, so, yeah, I always put it on. Yeah, I, I do too. I'm just a creature of habit now. So what are some other ways you don't like to wait? I don't like, so if, I, if I've set my mind to doing a project and it involves other people in that process and they say they're going to do something, in a timely manner and they don't um, and you just keep waiting and waiting and I can feel my flesh just <laughs> starting to crawl or or if there's some kind of barrier um, like whether it's uh, customer service people that don't seem to get what you're trying to tell them like this seems unfair or like what's this and they're kind of rude you on the phone and they put you into this long queue um yeah that's that's frustrating too um yeah. and you know what's funny is is something that i've learned and some of you watching you probably have learned this too um you can easily lose your jesus and then there's no door that's open for you to share and i'm not saying that every time i'm on the phone with you know verizon or blue cross blue shield or whatever that i'm witnessing but if but if the opportunity is there and you've lost your cool and you've been rude there's no opportunity. And so yep. part of me waiting, I've been starting to notice that, okay, Chris, 
Um, you're waiting longer than you want. It's taking them longer to do what they want. They're wrong. They're, they're, they're supposed to be helping me, but how I respond, and we're going to talk about that later too, right? Yeah, gonna, yeah. How you respond in the wait. You know, um, you know, I'm typical, Corey, the same way. I don't like traffic too much, but I blow bubbles. People who watch me know that I blow bubbles in traffic because, <laughs> you know, every, everybody loves a bubble. And you, can't get, you can't get mad. You can't get mad at a bubble. I think that's the first time I've ever heard anybody say that. That's amazing. Uh, well, it was it was from a, a wedding. I was I've been in twenty nine weddings and um and uh, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, I stopped. I said after that, I just write you a check. <laughs> and uh, and so I had bubbles from a wedding, and I was at an intersection, and I started blowing them out the sunroof, and people started looking and smiling, and I'm like, oh, like. Like all of a sudden I thought, you know what? It, it just relieved a little stress. So now I, I do it everywhere and I've got other people doing it everywhere as well. And I'll get emails. They go, Chris, were you in Arizona? I'm like, no. Were you in Ohio? No, because somebody else was blowing bubbles in traffic. <laughs> and it just, because we're such a stressed out, but um, traffic is one. Um, I try to have the mindset that maybe God is delaying me for a reason. It's a divine delay, yeah. you know, yeah. um, but sometimes, but, but if you're in a hurry, you're just like, I don't care about no divine delay. I'm, I'm, I yeah. got to get there. Um, obviously, lines in stores, waiting rooms, your doctor's waiting room. What? Why does it take so long? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, customer service. This is a big one for me. And if some of you, this is a big one for you, put in the chat like what you don't like. But I get struggled with people who don't change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, They're I'm not saying 20 years from now. I'm not saying that people are probably saying that about me or God may be saying that about me. Because, you know, I, I, I listen. You know, that, no, that's not you, Chris. I'm very you obedient know. to God. Um, <laughs> but um, but when people say, like in your book, you're talking about when people say they want this, they want this, but they do nothing to get there. You've given them the solution. You've given them the canoe, the boat, the helicopter. You, you've given them guidance and yeah. they stay in that same place and they never change. They never mature. Two years later, five years later, they're still in the same place, still whining and complaining, still inconsistent church, still picking the wrong people to date, still having problems with their marriage. And yep. I'm just like, Lord, I I, I want to be their friend, but they're taking life from me yep. Yep. and waiting for them to change. Um, I just assume go. I'm, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And there are times that God doesn't want you to be done with them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's uh. taking a little longer. Than, than I want to, but what about you and that? Is that a thing that- Yeah, I mean, I, I have some people just recently in my life that have been very hurtful. I mean, very hurtful to me. And one night I, I went to bed and I couldn't sleep and I was up and I happened to be listening to this ministry message and they happened to be talking about difficult relationships and how God told them not to give up on the relationship. And it was like God speaking to me saying, Corey, don't give up on this person. Love them. Help them through this. Like, I've, not, that... I've not given up on you. Yeah. I've not given up on you. When, when you had all your temper tantrums and fits and, 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 you know, the real test, Chris, I believe is love people the way we want to be treated, treat others the way we want to be treated and to love our enemies, you know, yes. pray for them. Like, you know, what is it that you love the people that love you? Jesus said, there's no, everybody does that. Even the pagan, even the, the person that cares nothing about God does that, but it's a testimony yeah. of me living in you when you can show mercy and kindness to people that don't deserve it. And you can stick in the trenches with them. Now, I'm not saying that there's never a time, but what we're talking about, Chris, is being led by the Holy Spirit and not let our flesh dictate when and what we do, right? Right, right. And of course, you know, sometimes when we're in the middle of that wait is when we meet people, is when we are there to minister to somebody yep. and we're waiting and and we don't like the wait, but like, but there's somebody else in the wait with you. And so God is in the middle of that. But if we're so focused on ourselves and what we're doing, 
And some of the frustration of wait is because we're behind. You know, we didn't say no to something. We, you know, um, left our house late because we overslept because we stayed up too late watching something, which, you know, and, and we're tired. Um, we didn't, you know, our, our lives aren't balanced enough. We, we don't have good boundaries. And so that affects the wait because when you, you know, if you've ever been to where you were waiting and you didn't care, you're like, I don't care. It's good. In fact, you know, I recently took my car in to get the oil changed and it's just the most, uh, it's the greatest car place that I love, but it's disgustingly dirty. I'm, I'm just telling you, it is not a place like the waiting room, the, the magazines are like 1992. Um, there is, you, you don't even want to use the restroom. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, it, it's, it's a bunch of guys. I've, been in, I've totally been in places like that. that. Work on cars. And, but there's no internet, there's no phone connection at all in the waiting room, none. And you're forced to just sit there. And most time there's no people, sometimes just one other person. And it's like, I really kind of like that I can't get on the phone. Yep. And I can just sit and hear God. There's some level of freedom. Like yes. not everyone's pinging you constantly. Yes. Like, like you have some level of freedom. I love that being on airplanes. Yep. They're making it more accessible now. But for five hours, I can relax without email interruption and you know whatever now, now now they're allowing like free wi-fi and stuff so it becomes even more difficult but anyways yes. so chris yeah what, what are some ways that god makes us wait let, 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 like what are some of the ways that you believe like god is asking us as his people to wait well I, you know i i think direction you know, you're waiting yep. for God to give you direction, direction. Yep. And should I sell my house? Should I move? Should I uh, go out with this person? Should my kids do this? Should I spend money here? Should I, should I, should I? And you don't always feel like you get direction. And then some people will say, well, you're not close enough to God. You know, you're not, you're not quiet enough to hear. And it could be true. It could be true. And then, but just sometimes God isn't saying anything because he's not ready for you to move, but you're ready to move. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of the opposite of people who can't seem to move and God has yep. given them direction. And this is the opposite. God has chosen not to say anything and you're ready to go. And it's just that frustration of waiting and waiting for when he says, you know, yes, go, Chris, go. You know, those prayers that we, you know, we've prayed for his healing for something. We've prayed for this relationship. We've prayed for our finances. And he doesn't always answer. He may say yes, no, maybe sometimes never, et cetera. But it's just like the waiting when he doesn't really say anything. Mm -hmm. That kills me because I'm, I'm a mover and a shaker. I, oh, mean, yeah. God, I, I love I love for him to speak and just move. Like, God, what's our agenda today? And he's not saying anything. And it's like, and not only is he not saying anything, yep. you're going through pressure. You're around difficult people. People are telling you to jump, move, scream. You should be doing this. Or you should be doing, I think God is upset. I mean, there's a million things that he can, that people are saying why you're in this predicament or why God's not moving. And a lot of times it's, it's none of that. It's God teaching us to trust him by faith. And we'll get into that. We, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but uh, there's also things like you're trusting and believing God for marriage. You believe that God's put that in your heart. But all your friends are getting married. And if you are in one more wedding, you're going to go crazy. You have to learn not to be jealous. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's like. And, he, and be supportive of them. Right. And right. You know, want to get that card and go, I'm so happy for you that you found the love of your life. I've been waiting way longer. Yep. Or they're getting married for the third time. I didn't even have one. Right, right, right. You know? Or. If I hear one more cute story of how great their husband is, how great their children are, how great, how great, you know, and my husband's a bum and he doesn't go to church with me and he sits on the couch all the time, you know, when God, when is God going to get him right? You know, when's God going to make him make some changes and go to church with me? And so I think there's definitely some struggles in that area as well. Yeah. Um, what, like, what about, what about, for increase in finances and that, yeah. um, but I, I do, Chris, I think you're going to ask me, um, what were you going to ask me? Go for it. Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, you've been writing this book for a while yep. and, you know, 
I mean, this writing books, because I've written a few now, um, every time, like, you know, I'm, I'm go out to different events, whatever. And I know that person who's heard me speak or like, they're looking for the next one. Like when you go to a concert, you're looking for the next CD. Yeah. And I go, they don't have any idea that one, it's got to be from God. Two, it takes a long time. The, the big Bible study that I wrote, Intentional Relationships, it took three and a half years to write it. And, and, and so, because I have a co-author, Dan Houck, and they just don't understand. My FAQs of singles ministry took at least three years to write. And so it's, it's just a really long, drawn-out process because there's so many factors involved in it. And I know people are tired of waiting for it. But, you know, I know your book, people, like I asked you yesterday, I said, so is the book done? You know, and uh, and I'm sure a lot of people have, have asked you that for the last oh, year. I get asked, I get asked all the time too. They're like, when's it done? I'm like, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's not done yet. But I mean, you know, we're in different seasons of life, right? I work full time for Destiny Rescue. I have a teaching ministry on top of that. And then in all of my spare time, I'm I'm writing and trying to finish it. So it's taken two years of and and the last year was like a solid year. But before that, before the two years of starting the writing. I did a year of doing an outline and granted it wasn't, I wasn't as like, it, that wasn't as time consuming to do the outline, but prayerfully considering what are the chapters about, what are the sub chapters and, and then having the courage to step out and start like, so it has been a much more drawn out process than I thought, but yeah. each step of the way, when I would get to another place, I would meet a new person that could help me with publishing or with Ooh. editing, or with, uh, you know, just to encourage me, I really feel like, like yeah. one of the pastors that, at a church I was at, he was like, I really feel like you're supposed to write a book. I go, it's interesting you're saying that. God's been stirring my heart for a year to start writing a book. And so that was the seed of faith to step out and start doing it. So, but yeah. to your point, there's been a lot of waiting process yeah. in, in this journey. And uh, can I tell you, Chris, I wasn't ready to write it before now. And there were things, I was actually talking with my, one of my colleagues from work. She's written two books. And she was like, you know, Corey, there's things I had to experience as, once I started the book that I needed to experience before I could finish the book. And I go, that happened to me too. Like there were things I knew that I knew I was to include in the book. And it was something that happened to me recently. And so the waiting, there's something beautiful about the wait that if you'll trust God and not get out ahead of him, which we're going to talk about more tonight. And there's going to be some powerful stories that um, it's really trusting God's timing. It really comes down to trust. Yeah. And you said something really powerful just a second ago. Like if we are so impatient, we may miss those other people that are going to speak into your waiting. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so, you know, one of the chapters in intentional relationships is intentional friendship. And it's this period of time between somebody, you know, casually and somebody you're going to date. And it forces you to wait and ask the hard questions to get to know somebody. So you can then make a, a proper assessment of whether you should move forward. And people don't want that. They want instantaneous online. Oh my gosh, I've known him like my whole life. And it's been three hours. And they want that instant relationship, the instant job, the instant success, the instant finances. We want all those things. I remember my mom used to say, why is it that young people think that they should have what it took 20, 30 years for their parents to get? And, and so we're in that instant yep. society, instant of, of wanting to be, you know, valued and patted on the back and you get a trophy for showing up. And so I think that that feeds into this waiting of mm -hmm. like, I can't see God in this. There is no God in this. He's making me suffer. I'm having to go through this horrible situation of sickness or my finances, or yet here I am again in a job I don't like, and I don't want to wait anymore. And so some people don't. They quit they, they, without God. You right? know, I, absolutely, Chris. I couldn't agree more. Like, and that is the critical point. When the pressure is on, when the fire is turned up and it's hot, 
And what I mean by that, it's it's very uncomfortable for you. You don't like the season you're in. It the, it seems like like there's pressure all around you, whether financially or difficult people at work or a spouse or kids or extended family or a neighbor, like whatever it is, you don't like it. And the the easy thing to do is to jump ship just to jump ship because you don't want to feel the pain or the uncomfortableness of it. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. Prayerfully consider what God would have you do. You see, you might be on a strategic assignment in this fiery trial that God is working something out in you, but he's also wanting to use you in a dark place to offer hope. I was in a very difficult work environment. When I when I graduated college, I went and I, I moved to the city and I was involved in this company. And there was all these people around my age that were working there as well. And they quickly found out I was a Christian. And not that I was overtly like in your face a Christian, but I didn't swear like they did. I didn't talk about course joking with them. And so when I would go from my desk to the back room uh, where others worked, because I had to talk with them, they would go, here comes the Jesus freak. And, uh, or they would laugh under their breath at me coming in, or they would, uh, they would get quiet and they would stop talking if I came around and it made me feel horrible inside. It made me like, feel like I hate this work environment. I mean, it's terrible. And one night I said, God, either get them fired or do something you live inside of me and you reign supreme in this place. And I'm asking you to do something about that. Well, it continued. And, but eventually one night we, my, I had to work late on this project and this other guy, the ringleader, he was one of the ringleaders of this. He said, he, he said, he walked over to my desk and said, you know, Corey, what do you think about this? Do you, when people graduate college, do they stop believing in God? And I said, you know, that's a great question. I said, those that have a genuine relationship with Jesus and they they walk with him, they know who he is and he's alive and well in their life. I would say the answer is no, but those where they have one foot in Christianity and one foot in the world, and they're kind of like dabbling with God, but they're not placing their complete faith and trust in God. Um, then people walk away from God all the time. And and I said, but God wants us to have a personal relationship with him. And he goes, well, you know, Corey, everybody's jealous of you. We're all jealous of you. You you have peace, you have joy, you, you're confident and we're anything but that. And I said, you know, I just want you to know, I, I said, I just want you to know that I have gone through hell and back in my own life. And I shared all the stories some of the struggles I've been through, some of the challenges I've gone through in my my family history about my parents' divorce and uh, the abuse I went through. And he goes, you went through that? You yeah. had to go through that? And I go, I did, I did. He goes, wow, I, would, I never would have guessed that. And I said, you know, the only difference between me and you is that I've placed my trust in Jesus Christ. Like it's, I'm not perfect. I, I, I am a mess up and I'm a screw up. And in and, and all honesty, I was insecure, but Christ taught me who I was in him. And so I have peace today. I'm confident in who he's made me to be. And he's offering that to you. And I, I'm not pressuring you, but if you want to accept Jesus into your heart, you just in your heart, you say, I want Jesus to come into my life to pay for my sin. And I want to discover what he, you, what he has for me the destiny and purpose he has for me. Can I tell you, that was the most incredible conversation. And from that day forward, Chris, he respected me and he never made fun of me again. And that whole situation in that office completely changed. And it was like, and I remember thinking it was worth the wait. It was worth the pain and the discomfort to be able to share with this guy who was really broken and it all came out as this macho person, but he was hurt and wounded inside. And I say, God, I would do it all over again 
to share the same truth of the gospel with him. But you know, when you're in the middle of it, you, you, oh, yeah. you know, you have blind oh. spots. The pain is so bad. You, you want to run. Um, oh. And so you, you know, and so, or somebody tells you, this is, this is one of my pet peeves, Corey, people who write books that finally got the one and then they write a book and they go, the wait was worthy. You know, oh. you could do it too. I'm like, uh, you're married now. Uh, <laughs> I don't really want to listen to you, you know, and, right. but they were in that wait and they waited and waited and waited and they waited for God's best. They didn't settle or maybe they did in the beginning. And then they decided, you know what, I'm, I'd rather have nobody than not have the wrong, wrong person uh, or I'd rather be single than wish I was single. And so, um, and so, but though, but the problem is, is it's really hard to hear from somebody who finally yeah. got what they've been waiting for. I think that it's sometimes better to hear from somebody who hasn't gotten what they've waited for. Or that at least, or that at least, huh? Or that at least have had a serious wait time. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, and that can encourage you. But for somebody who says, oh my gosh, it is worth the wait. I was 24, now I'm 26, and I waited and I waited. (laughs) And now it's the most incredible thing ever. And I'm like, you haven't waited nothing. That's nothing. Yeah, yeah. It's literally yeah. nothing. Like, yeah. like, and now they you have, have all the answers. Correct, correct. You have but, all the but it's all relative because for them, yeah. where they are, you know, I remember being at school and having to wait for the class to end and you look at the clock and it seemed like it take forever. And then yeah. now you're like, what happened? Where did that hour go? Um, <laughs> you know, I shared this with you yesterday that, and I want to just do this very quickly because I definitely want to get on to the rest of the, the message. Please put in the chat, folks, put in the chat. You know, things that you're not good at waiting at, things that drive you crazy, things that God does, you know, maybe put in a story of where you've had to wait and, or maybe you're in a waiting season now and you don't like it. Put that in the chat because I think it helps other people to hear from you as well, because we by no means, you know, know everything in this area. But um, I shared this with Corey last night. Some of you have heard this story where, you know, I was in, in singles ministry in my 20s. And I, after three years of, of working my way up to the top of leadership, I just felt I know everything now. And I was like 29 and I am called to go start ministries in every church around the world. And every church I went to literally almost laughed at me and shut the door in my face. And I ended up at a little itty bitty Baptist church of a hundred people with 10 old men who ran it. And I'm not going to the real details of that, but I ended up there. The book Experiencing God had come out. And um, and so God was teaching me to wait. And so, but I didn't know at the time. And then I, I ended up with children and then I did teenagers and then I did college ministry. And then I, I moved back to the Raleigh area and I started serving. And then fast forward all these years, God called me into full-time ministry. And then it hit me one day. I looked back and went, now I know why I went through that and that and that. First, he had to get a little Chris off of Chris because I made it about me. Yep. And he says, Chris, I can't yeah. use you the way I want to use you when you think you're the one that's done it. Yep. Amen. And, so, and you don't like waiting, but I'm going to make you wait. And I'm not, not only am I going to make you wait, but I'm going to make you serve in ministry that you really don't want to do. Children, teenagers. Because he was, I needed to learn obedience. I needed to learn faithfulness. I needed to learn listening. Because if I'm going to do this ministry one day, all those things were needed. So if you look at dating relationships, why does God make you wait to grow, to work on you? Why does God make you wait, you know, and it takes a while, maybe you're dating somebody and you're not ready to marry because he's trying to teach you something. He's trying to show you something. You're not ready. Why why don't I have the greatest job and and I can be, you know, whatever, because again, you're not mature enough to handle that job. That's going to require not only spiritual maturity, but life maturity. But in the meantime, while I was in that, I couldn't see it. But when I look back, I went, oh my goodness, everything I see this relationship and this church I worked at and this one, all of it was a 10 year process of yep. waiting before yep. God actually called me into ministry. And I'll be honest with you, Corey, if that first church, if God said to me, Chris, it's going to be 10 years before you're going to be in full-time ministry. <laughs> so um, this is just a waiting period. I'd be like, I don't think so. I'm out of here. He didn't say that. He didn't say anything. 
And I just yeah, was, we would give up. We would it, give up. We would give up. But I didn't. I just kept going because I go, well, this isn't what I really want to do, but I want to serve God. This yeah. isn't really the place I want to live, but I want to serve God. I really want to be married, but I want to serve God. And that's how I looked at it. And slowly, slowly, I grew up a little bit more and grew up a little bit more. I mean, I'm not there yet, but I, I'm better than where I was. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I, you know, the weight really does teach us. We're, we will we'll get into that more, but there's something that God teaches us in the weight that we can't learn other things that are necessary for where God's taking us. Uh, yes. in our in each of our lives and so but there's other people who've had to wait in the bible can you oh name, my goodness. Can just you name, a, like, let's just let's just quickly name some people who had to wait in the bible so people can know you're not alone like this is not a foreign concept tons of people in the bible had to wait this is this is a spiritual principle that you all godly me. people i thought it was just me and you you know i, I thought used to think that. I used to think that until you keep reading the word of God and you start seeing that God has all these people that he had on the potter's wheel and he was refining them in these waiting seasons. And no, most people don't like to wait. Yeah. And, I, and, before, I took pottery classes many, many years ago. I got vertigo. And I was the third time I got vertigo, I was in the hospital for a week and I couldn't work for three months. I was in really bad shape. So I took pottery classes because I'm like, why not, right? It's so hard to get something centered on the wheel. It's years and years and years of experience. And so I got to this point where you go, you know, <laughs> that was fun. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't really equipped to spend years to hone the craft. But so now when I see a really nice mug and it's like $30, I go, probably to me, it's worth 100 because I know the years and years that went in to make that beautiful piece of art. But I love that was what you said, but you're right. We're, he, we're all that piece of clay on that wheel, aren't we? We are. We are. And if you choose to stay there and let the master shape you, we're talking Jesus. Well, who, who are some people? He, he will make you know, divine, uh, something beautiful that he can use for divine purposes. So there, Moses, 40 years on the backside of the wilderness. 40 years on the backside of the wilderness. And then he spent 40 years in the wilderness, like with God's people going around the map, like going around and around and around. We'll, we'll, I've seen that bush. We'll, we'll, I've seen that bush. We'll learn more about that story too. But who else? Who else are some people? Joseph. Oh my yeah. goodness. We did for the cub bear to tell Pharaoh for 22 years. Um, 22 years? He was in, he was. When the, from the time he had the dream to the time he met his brothers was 22 years. But while he was in prison, he divinely gave, a, like interpreted the dream of two people, the baker and the cupbearer. The cupbearer was reinstated into his position and Joseph knew he would be. And he said, when you, when you are reinstated in Pharaoh's court, yeah. tell Pharaoh that I've been justly, unjustly put in here and that um, get me out of here. But he was in there for two more years. And the Bible says that the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph. But yeah. at just no, the I right time, forget. I didn't forget. At just the right time, God gave Pharaoh a dream and no one could interpret it. But guess who? Joseph. God divinely gave Joseph the insight and he shared how uh, they were going to, that they could, he devised a plan that could save. Egypt and the surrounding nations from this great famine. Uh, there'd be seven years of prosperity and seven years of famine. And um, they, Pharaoh loved it. And he put him into the second most powerful position. In, and um, I think about where he started. I mean, he was, he was a little bit full of himself, you know what I'm saying? I mean, he yeah, was yeah. young, yeah. a little smart mouth on him. You know, he was the favored, the coat of many colors. And, you know, his brothers were so, so wrong. And they threw him in that pit. And I'm thinking, if I was in that pit, I'd be like, yeah, I pretty much done it. Yep, it's it. This is it. This is it. This is the end of my life. Who would have ever thought? And I think about other people who are out there that are financially struggling. They have health issues. Their families abandon them. Maybe their marriage end. And they don't see anything. They don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. But yet, look what God did with him. And, of course, at the end, the reconciliation of his family. Um, you know, Anna. 
Uh, she's a prophetess. And yeah. she waited 60 plus years to see the baby Jesus. And then Simeon, he was like right there with her, um, also was told by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he saw baby Jesus, another person who waited. Who else? Um, let's Abraham. see. Um, Abraham and Sarah is a great example. Oh. <laughs> um, they had you to wait. What? Sorry, people, people, I'll be at events, I'll be at a conference speaking or whatever. And, and I'll say, yeah, you know, I hope to be married one day, but you know, at my age, you know, it's pretty slim. And, and I always have that lady that comes up and goes, well, Sarah, you know, God gave her a baby, her old age. I'm like, uh, no, I didn't say I want a baby, um, <laughs> but, but it's like, they're trying to encourage you to say, well, look what God did the Bible. I'm like, yeah, you're right. God can do that. But um, did they live to be 800 years old too? Anyway, um, and so I just was like, I love their support, but uh, it, it doesn't always make you feel good that you've waited this long. And right. uh, and then you do feel like giving up, you know? So did Sarah feel like giving up or do you think she did? She did. I mean, they definitely got out ahead of God and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about getting out of God's timing yeah. uh, in, in the way. And then, yeah. you know, I, I love the story of Nazareth. Yes. Uh, Lazarus, not Nazareth, Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus. That's he, his cousin. That's his cousin. He got sick. He got sick. And Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, come, come. But the Bible says he stood, he stayed away yep. for four days and Lazarus died. And they, in their minds, they couldn't comprehend that Jesus could bring people back to life. Like they missed the opportunity. We, we, we asked you to come. You didn't come. And Jesus was showing them that you can trust me in the delays. You can trust me when the time that I'm coming and the time you think I should come do not coincide. But there's and a difference. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna share a little bit, two pieces of scripture from that story of why Jesus delayed. Mm -hmm. So Corey, how can we trust God through a waiting season? Like yep. how let just let's define it what what is the waiting season the waiting season is when when you know that god's spoken to you something he's put something in your heart whether to start a business maybe it's he's calling you to ministry to be a missionary or to have kids one day and no matter what it seems to be the furthest thing in the world away that it's not coming to pass like at first you were so excited that the dream's going to come to pass and you're ready you're quote unquote ready to make it happen and you're ready to conquer the world for Jesus. Um, or maybe God's put in your heart to reconcile with a child or uh, your, your husband. And it just seems beyond repair. The key is you're the, ready. The wait, you're the wait is when God promises you it. And then the fulfillment of it, the wait is the in-between time. And that in-between time, God doesn't tell you exactly when he's going to fulfill something. What he's saying is, I know that exact time, and I'm asking you to trust me. Or it's the in-between time when you're in a fiery trial, and the world seems to be against you. The, the weight of the world is on you. You feel friction, like I did at this company that I was working for. And I wanted to quit. I wanted to run from the situation, but I felt God stirring my heart, stick in it, trust me, I'm, I'm in this. And so between the time when it starts to the time when it finishes, that's the wait. It's the time that you don't know what God is doing and he's asking you to trust him. Yep. You know, often I, I've shared this many, many times over the years that, you know, when I find a penny or I find coins on, a, on American coins, they say, in God, we trust this story yep. doesn't work when I'm in Europe. And, uh, and so every time I see a penny, specifically a penny, because nobody ever picks up a penny, but you see it miscellaneous and it's always in a place that shouldn't be like, yeah. you know, you expect it to be someplace that's on the ground or whatever, but it always ends up in a weird place. God is saying right at that time, Chris, what are you not trusting me in? You know, what is it that you're getting ahead of me? What is it that I've already spoken to you about this? I've already revealed I'm, or I'm not going to reveal it's, it, you know, you're not going to do this. You're not going to do this. You're not going to go here. You know, what it, and I have to just stop and just say, I trust you. you you've showed up so many times in my life. Yes. You've given me so much. You've helped me so much. You use me despite me. Yep. You know, there are people watching this right now, Corey, and, and some of them are in the chat I've seen. Yep. There are some people watching this that, 
you know, they sometimes don't feel that God would want to use them. Yep. That God is interested in them. Yep. But I've seen people transform. Like they're not even close to the same person they used to be. And, I, and it's because they've grown and they've changed and they've learned about being in the weight and they've yep. learned to stay yep. faithful in the middle of that. And that's hard. So one, amen, I couldn't agree more, Chris. One thing, um, if if we know what, what the weight is, but if we know the purpose of why God allows these seasons of weight, why would God allow us to go through seasons of difficulty, of high pressure situation, trials, or these long periods of like, you don't know what God's up to, and he's teaching you to trust him by faith. Why, why would he allow this? If we can know that God is, has strategic purpose in the way, it can help us learn to wait well. And so what is the purpose of waiting? The way teaches us to trust God by faith and not by sight. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. So everything we do as a believer is learning to trust our creator our heavenly father, that he has a good plan, even when it looks like it's disastrous, even when it feels like painful and how you feel ripped off. But when you can say, God, I know that you're working this together for my good. You work all things together for my good. You have a good plan for me and you will get me to my destination. What you promise you will fulfill. He's the author and the what, Chris? The author and the finisher of our faith. So, so when God promises you something, he has every intention of bringing it to pass. So the key is to trust him when life doesn't make sense. Do you want to? And Corey, it's his plan. It's not our yes. plan. Yes. Yep. No, yep. You know, it's his plan of what he's doing. We're yep. building his kingdom, not our kingdom. So yep. his kingdom may not include a bigger house. His kingdom may not include a perfect marriage or a marriage at all. His kingdom may not include money or perfect health because he wants you to build his kingdom. And that's hard to look at too, because we're, we're so brainwashed to have this, you know, the, the, the house with the picket fence and the kids and the dog and all this, that may not be his plan. Right. And, and it's, 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 you know, it hurts to think that that may not be it. And you want that to be it. Or you compare yourself to other people where they are. Maybe they've gotten more. Maybe they've they've gotten to have some things you haven't had. And you're wondering when your turn is. And, but yet, don't be, be careful of the enemy because he quickly distracts you with that. And instead of say, late, looking at your life and going, wait a minute, look at all, all the things I've been able to do. Look at all the ways God used me. Look at the people I've been able to share with. Look at what I have seen that, I'm uniquely designed by God that he used me in those situations where Corey couldn't have been used or Terry who's watching or Roseanne who's watching, Amber who's watching. None of these people could have maybe been able to be used in the same situation. So I love that God's plan is for each one of us, right? Yep. A plan to yep. prosper and not, yeah, right? Jeremiah 20, I love it because it's about building his kingdom. So when you know this, you go, Oh my gosh, that's why I'm having to wait on this. That's why I'm going through this. God is getting me ready for something else. God doesn't want me to waste this. Let me just tell you, Corey, I've shared this before with you. My list, a lot of the listeners have, have seen me. Every time I go through stuff and it hurts yep. so much, mm -hmm. I am now far enough along in my walk that I know he wants me to use it. And it may not mean then because I have hurt involved, but he wants me to use purpose yeah. in the pain, purpose in the weight, purpose in the joy, purpose yeah. in having a lot, purpose in having none. And so I, when I'm going through it, I'm like, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's a, I don't know if I'm going to use it this year. It might be 10 years from now, but I know there's a value to this, but Lord, it doesn't feel good right now. And I, and, and, what, and what I love about God is that he's the great comforter. So yep. even if he says, um, like I love when Peter was down, you know, Peter was walking on water and he looked at his circumstances and he started to fall and Jesus grabbed him like, ye little faith. The storm did not stop until they got back in the boat. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is walking with him in the storm. 
So it's not a wand and magic because you cried out to me in the wait and you wanted to be over with that. I'm just going to go, okay. He's saying, I'm with you. Amen. You know, the storm doesn't end. The trial doesn't end until God says it's time. And when is the right time? When the storm or the trial accomplishes in us what God is looking for it to accomplish. That's a word. Somebody needs to write like that. Refiners. It's these things that, are refining. They're refiners. The, yes. the refiners fire in, in us that God's bringing out impurities. He's bringing out pride. He's, he's removing uh, the lack of trust, control, hurts, unforgiveness, whatever it is, God is bringing to the surface through pressure and all kinds of things that need to be removed from us. And had the pressure not been there, we wouldn't see it. We wouldn't see these things, these irritations when we lose our cool with our families or right. close friends that we, we're not as patient with them as we would be with Billy Graham or the president of the United States or whoever that we will be on our best behavior. We're not talking about best behavior. We're talking about who you are when no one's looking and there's pressure put on you and you act less than your best. And so there's a person, there's a, there's a story in the Bible, Chris, yeah. um, Abraham and Sarah, that God gave them a dream that they would, that God would bless the whole world through through them and their seed. And Abraham didn't have any children and he thought it was gonna, his inheritance would go to his servant. And God said, no, it's gonna come through your seed and through Sarah, but it kept being delayed and delayed and delayed. And eventually Abraham and Sarah had a bright idea. What happens when we have bright ideas that are not God ideas? Yeah. They, it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. And so they had Ishmael, who was not the promised child, and it actually became a thorn in the flesh towards when, when God finally, and God told Abraham and Sarah, this is not the promised child. The promised child will not come through Ishmael. And which Sarah, Abraham's wife said, we can't have children, even though God said that they would. Um, so let me give you my maid servant and you sleep with her, marry her, sleep with her, and we'll have a child through her. Well, as soon as that happened, uh, Hagar, the maid servant, began to treat with contempt Sarah. And it was just a, it, it was a messy, dysfunctional situation. But God said, no, it's going to come through Sarah and Abraham, the, the, the promised child. So God eventually gave them Isaac at, at just the right time. And, um, but this is, this is the powerful thing that I want, want us to learn through this story. God exhausted all of Abraham and Sarah's ability to try in the flesh to make it happen. And when they fell flat on their face and they couldn't do it in their own, that is when God showed up and did what only God could do. And so God, many times in our lives, through the waiting seasons, through the pressure and the trials, he brings us to an end of our ability where we recognize we can't make the promise of God come to pass ourselves. We need his help. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance. Chris, you, that 10 year period you went through, yeah. that is what you learned. You learned that, didn't you? Why don't you share about that? Of the 10 year period? Yes. Like you, at first, when you, when God first called you to ministry, you thought you were ready. I did. You were, you were ready did. and equipped, but I, uh, I thought I learned everything I needed to learn in those three years in solo. And I was ready to go out and tell everybody how to do it. And not yep. realizing that as a woman, I was limited. I did not have really any education. I did not have experience. I did not have a lot of contacts. Um, I just had gusto, <laughs> enthusiasm, but I didn't have enough experience to be leading singles for anybody, um, not on my own anyway. And so um, I had to get some life experience. I had to get more Bible training. I had to get more, you know, helping as a volunteer with other people, I had to continue to be under other people, um, working with different churches and, and just submitting to ways, things I didn't want to submit to, submitting to the ways that other people do things that I didn't like. 
Um, and so after, you know, you accumulate all that knowledge and then I was also in greeter ministry and I put on events and I did marketing and advertising for people who did do singles ministry and you just learn and learn and learn. And then you get to a place to where you start leading the Bible study. I led Bible studies for seven years. I taught them. And then I learned from that. And you get to a place to where you look back and you go, now I'm ready. I feel God has called me. And I remember the very first time somebody asked me to do a conference and I said, what do you mean? Like a retreat? Would you be our speaker at our retreat? And I go, uh, I've never done that before. Uh, I've done Bible studies, but the study's already written. You're just facilitating it. And I went, yeah. uh, and, and so they said, well, you know, if you want somebody else, no, I, I can do it. I, I can do it. And I had to write it and teach it. I'm sure it was terrible. Um, but I remember that was the beginning of then it would, from that point on, God just kept opening doors, opening doors, opening doors. But it was, you know, I hadn't, I had definitely written and I had spoken, but I'd never done something like that. And the, how it was, how it was successful in God's eyes is because it became the content of it became everything that I'd gone through in those 10 years. Amen. And and that's how that that kind of fruition. Um, you know, so I God think about prepared you. God yeah. prepared you. Yeah. But you go back to how do you wait? Are you a good waiter? Do you wait with anger? You you wait getting ahead of God. You wait right. with, I'm not gonna wait for God to do this. I'm just gonna do it myself. I'm gonna go get a credit card and I'm gonna go buy what I want to buy. And then two years later, you're you're filing bankruptcy. Or I'm gonna go get me a man, I'm gonna go get me a woman, as long as they sort of kind of believe and go to church, that's good enough because I'm tired of waiting. And yep. then you have a horrible marriage. Um, I had one woman wanted to know when I sign off for her getting artificially inseminated because she was tired of waiting on God to give her a child. Yep. Yep. And I said, absolutely not. She's single. And I said, why don't you think about foster care? There's other things that will give you a child. Well, I want one of my own. And so I'm like, but a foster child could be your own. You can adopt them. And so God has showed me about getting ahead of him, about when you're not good at waiting, yep. um, what happens to you when you're not good at waiting, but also what happens when you are good at waiting. Yep. And, and when you, um, like Simeon, who was waiting faithfully for when, you know, because God had promised him um, and that he got to see Jesus and his commitment, the scripture, um, taught, I, I love this. This is the scripture where he says that, uh, in, um, Luke, let me pull up the scripture, Luke, um, pull it back up. Luke two, um, he said, um, now I've lost my, lost my, my place. Let me try to find it again. Oh my goodness. I've completely lost where I was. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. I love that. So here he is a, a mature Christian, right? He's mature, a follower of the Lord. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting and wait. Look what we're at, what's going on in the world today. And the Holy Spirit was on him. He said it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, moved by the spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom law required, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God. He praised God for the weight. He praised God for what God was doing. And I love that. Yep. And and I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't always praised God for the weight. Yep. You know? no. I haven't always praised God when he finally shows something. I'm like, wow. Can you told me a lot earlier? Yep. I've been negative, but no, but then it goes into Anna. You know, I shared earlier that Anna, her husband had died earlier in her life. And she, it says here that this Anna was a prophet, the daughter of Peniel of the tribe of Asher. She was old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then she became a widow. Can you imagine you've waited so long to get married, married like everybody else. You're going to have your kids. You're going to have your life. That's what you do. And then they die. That wasn't the plan. And it didn't, she didn't remarry. She stayed single. Right. And I loved it because she said um, she was a widow until she was 84. So I'm wondering if she died after she got to see Jesus. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. So her response to the way, she prayed more. She right. fasted more. She praised the Lord. She, she worshiped, she right? Trusted. Yep. She trusted more. So I, after about year 30, I'd be like, okay, 
I'm done. Right. <laughs> yep. think about, I think about Jeremiah and his, and what he had to do for 40 years. And so I see that Corey. And I think, I don't, the only way you could praise God in such a long wait is that you have to be close to God. Yep. You do. And you know, and you know what he's doing. Yep. And, by faith, by faith. So, you know what he's doing by faith. Yes. And you, yeah. And you can see that there's a purpose in this. And so she waits for the child. And then of course, Jesus comes and, and, uh, and she goes coming up to them at this very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all. So during this wait, people think like Noah, this lady's a little crazy. What is she waiting for? But she got to tell people over and over and over and over. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He's coming. Our savior, he's coming. And she got to witness over and over and over. And I just think, wow, what if she'd only done it for 30 years, 30 uh, the, or 20 years, 40 years of people she would have never got to witness to. Amen. And you, because, because Chris, because yeah. she trusted God, her name is now written down and we're talking yeah. about her. Yeah. The first yeah. The you know, you mentioned something really powerful, Chris, uh, about learn there's, you can wait well, or you can wait by complaining. Did you like how we wait actually matters to God. And like, you can't shorten the time of the wait, but you can prolong it yeah. because of the way we're choosing to wait. In other words, if we wait with a complaining negative attitude, which in the beginning, I had lots of those pity party moments. I was kicking and screaming. I didn't understand what God was doing, but we can learn and grow and say, God, I want to do it the right way. You know, the Israelites in the Bible is a great example. God delivered them out of slavery and bondage by the mighty, from the mighty Egyptians through his plagues and uh, through his servant Moses and brought them was going to take them into the promised land that he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and God had showed them that it didn't matter who came up against them. God was would cause them to be victorious. But they had this complaining spirit. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy 1-2, it is only 11 days journey from Horeb, the Mount Sinai, where they were. They went there after they were um delivered out of Egypt they went there to worship and after that by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea on Canaan's border yet Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before crossing the border and entering into Canaan in the promised land what was an 11 day journey ended up being 40 years in the wilderness they waited much longer than they had to why because of their complaining spirit and their lack of trust in God and so God said, I, if you don't trust me, fine, you won't enter. It's going to be for all the, the generation that's less than 20 years old will enter the land and will enter the promised land. And the rest of you, you'll die outside of that. So you, you'll die outside of the promised land. And my, th this is what's a powerful point, Chris, for all of us. We can have these beautiful promises from God, these desires he's put in us, not, not fleshly desire, but, but promises he's made us, but that's not a guarantee it will happen if we remain immature and don't learn how to wait well. Learn how to wait well. You know, Joe, and, and, and go here's ahead. Too. Uh, we, we didn't talk about this before, and I think those that are watching probably would agree to this, but what helps waiting is having people around you that can support you and encourage yep. you and remind you of what God has done and what God may be doing. Maybe they've already been through uh, having cancer. Maybe they've already been through a marriage that failed and, you know, and then God restored it, or maybe he didn't. And, and that person went on and, and, but they've been through something. And so having people with you. And so the enemy wants to get you by yourself. Yep. He wants, I mean, COVID was terrible for people, married and single. He wants to get you by yourself and make you have to deal with it. And, and so having people around you, not being, you know, being really careful, having that community, we need community so that it will help, help us during that. Now the Israelites had community, <laughs> but instead of helping each other, they all complained to each other. And that yep. actually created the mob that yep. created the building of the calf 
is is they all kind of you know went over the over the edge of the cliff like the pigs right they all kind of went there together but what if you were with a group of people that celebrated god a group of people that helped you through the situation you're going through and yes. the people that could say no i love it in the first church in acts where they sold everything they had to give to those who did not and 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 so they saw that it was kingdom building not personal building and so here they are, a gazillion people have been there for Passover. There's not enough stuff to go around. And yet they just shared with each other. I love that, you know, in their way, they yep. looked at it differently and acted differently. Yep. I'd be curious if our reader or people that are watching, I would really love to hear from you. I'd love for you to put in the chat. What have you seen in your life where God has made you wait and now you're going, oh my goodness, now I see what God's doing. Or, you know, how did it help to have people around you? Did, of course, I hope to help your, have your church or your small group or your family. But share in the chat because there's somebody that needs to read that chat and needs to read your story. Actually, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I, I don't want to uh, stop sharing. And we definitely want to hear from you as well. But, but Corey, go a little bit farther in, um, you know, just the challenge that people have in waiting well. Like, what do you think, you know, is going on in, in some of those struggles of why people are, are not really doing well in waiting? Absolutely. Well, I, I really believe at the core issue, there might be some peripheral things. I don't trust that God has my best interest in mind. Why am I going through this? It's uncomfortable. So I can't see anything good or positive out of this. There's not going to be a positive outcome. So I'm kicking and screaming and yelling, blaming other people and really not trusting God that God sees me. He hears me. He's for me. And if he's not removing it, there must be purpose in it. Just this week. I mean, we were preparing for this just this week. I had a very difficult situation happen at work and I found myself just getting so frustrated. I, was like, I have gone, this whole year has been very challenging for me in some ways. Uh, and I was like, I'm fed up with this. I am done dealing with this. Like, and, and I remember thinking, I am going to write this email and just send it off. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, do not send that. I went instead, I went and got wise counsel yes. and a, a good friend of mine, a godly man said, you know, Corey, I believe the reason these kind of situations this year keep happening to you is because there's something God wants to teach you that he wants to get this out of you, whatever it is. And I remember my flesh just rising up. I said, that makes me really mad. He goes, I knew it would. He goes, I knew it would. But Corey, look at it from a godly perspective, like ask God what he wants you to learn in the process. So this the, one of these nights this week, I couldn't sleep well, and I just was wrestling with God. God, help me learn what you're trying to teach me. Like, I want to do this well. I don't want to go around this mountain. I don't want to spend 40 years in the wilderness. I want to learn what you're trying to teach me. And I want to give my coworkers like, I want to treat them the way I want to be treated, to love them, um, to be gracious to them and kind. And can I tell you, the next day, interacting, it was like God worked it all out. And I didn't make it this big stink, but we just talked through it in respectful ways. And God orchestrated. I was like, God, you're so good. And there's something. So I want to encourage Anybody who's listening, could it be that the reason you're in what you're in right now is that there's something God is trying to teach you that's preparing you from where he's, where he's taking you? You see, God, like your gifting doesn't determine why you're in this situation. You could be the best singer in the world and do sing circles around the worship leader in the church. But probably the reason you're not is there's some, there could be some level of pride or there could be some level of learning to be grateful for the person who is in that role and learning to come under their authority instead of trying to usurp their authority and be the ringleader, so to speak. So, or, 
or maybe you have a gift to preach and that gift has been on you from the very beginning. I remember God calling me to preach and I thought I was so ready. 25 years later, God's teaching me things. And now like, I'm like, God, I don't even want to get up there unless I know that it's you. Chris and I were talking before we started this. We both of us felt a little nervous about it. That's a healthy fear of God. I don't want to say things that are not ungodly or that are not going to truly help people. So I really believe God's allowing you to go through what you're going through to prepare you and teach you who you are, more of who you are, that and the areas that you can grow and change it as you cooperate with the Holy Spirit and lean on him for help and to prepare you for where God's taking you. You know, I, I was going to share this earlier and, you know, and when Corey and I teach together, we have a plan. It may not look like we have a plan, but we have a plan, but we really love to bounce things off of each other and God brings things to mind. And you guys have been putting things in the chat, which I'm just so thankful to see some of these comments in the chat. But uh, I just got back from Europe. I was gone for four weeks, four countries, and uh, I did a lot of waiting. And uh, uh -huh. it's good waiting because I don't mind waiting in a two hour train. It can kind of breathe. And I'm always anticipating who I'm going to sit beside, who can I witness to. And then sometimes God just says, Chris, I just want you to be quiet that's hard, but yes. And there are times that I do, cause I get tired and I do need to be quiet. So I was actually, um, I was in Albania and I was headed back to London and, um, I had had a really tough, I've been like going, 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 going. And I really just was looking forward to getting to London and getting to my friend's house and just going to sleep and just, you know, in, to get ready for the next day. And so I, I had, um, had had a long week and I really didn't have any time for myself. And so I finally get on the plane. I was excited to be on the plane and, you know, it was a good plane. It was nice and air conditioned. It felt good. And we're sitting there and all of a sudden the lady comes on the intercom and she goes, by the way, the plane's going to be delayed an hour and a half because um, of bad weather in London. And I said, great. So I'm quickly texting uh, my friends and saying, okay, this is going to delay this and delay this and delay this. So you just, you know, which could be like, you know, 10 o'clock that night. And so, um, and they were like, you know, well, what do you do? Like, you can't do anything. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I go, well, okay, you're going to let us off the plane. So we can at least go back to the terminal. And they said, no, you have to stay on the tarmac. We can't let you off the plane. F, F, C, F, D, what, whatever the rules are, right? And, um, and so I said, like, you gotta be crazy. Like, it's, it's crazy. Why can't we get off the plane? But we did have air conditioning and I've heard people who don't have air conditioning and you're sitting there. So an hour and a half goes by and we finally get to go and we take off and it's a three hour flight. So we're up in the air and they go, oh, by the way, we, we didn't get any food. They forgot to give us food. <laughs> so nobody had any, they had like drinks, but no food at all. So now by the time I got into London, it had been five, almost five hours. I had had nothing but other some crackers that I brought with me. And I was really, really tired. Okay. And then I had to go from a train to, I had to do customs again, because I'm coming back into London. I'd go the next train, the next train, the next train. And people keep telling me different things and you need to use your phone. You used to swipe your credit card. You have to have a ticket. And I was just, just, just like this, right? And I remember the last train, the, the conductor just said, just go, don't worry about it, just go. And, and I went and I got to sit and then rest. So I finally make it to my friend's house and I get to bed that night and I look back at the delays. I look back and go, Lord, this was supposed to be a two, a three hour flight. And it was like 14 hours altogether from the beginning to the end. But in that time, I witnessed to the person that was beside me. Um, in that time, I witnessed to the person after I got off the plane. In that time, I went to get my bag. My bag took a long time to get. And I got to talk to a Muslim woman who is my friend now on Facebook, you know, and see what God's going to do there. In that time, I got to speak to someone on the first train. In that time, I got to speak to someone on the second train. And then somebody even on the third train. And then I realized that if I had left when I had left, then I would have missed all those people. Amen. So at the time, it didn't feel good. But then I look back and go, wow. Yep. Look at all the fruit that came out yep. when I was willing to wait 
Yeah. And I waited almost well to the very last spot. I didn't lose my Jesus. <laughs> I, was, I was emotional. I was so tired and I literally had tears in my eyes and they just said, go. And, um, and so then I got to share with somebody on that train. And so I, now I just go, you know, I don't like waiting. Corey it hasn't changed. I still don't like it, but I know he's doing something and Amen. we want to encourage our people, right? We want to encourage them that God is doing something in the way, even when you don't like it. Right. Yep. The, the story of Lazarus is, the, it was said the reason he waited was to bring God glory. The reason he waited so that others would believe because four days, three days, the Jews believe you could still be alive. But on four days, nope, he is dead. He's starting to smell. And Jesus said, I delayed so they would believe. Mm, yep. Who needs to believe in your life? Who needs to see you in your walk? Who needs to see you wait well? Who needs to see you in the middle of a horrible thing and that you are trusting God? Yep. Or you, Give us a final thought and, and close us out in prayer. And we yep. just want to thank everybody who's watched us and shared us. Um, and we just, we, we appreciate praying for us and, and supporting the work that God has called us to do. And I'll put in the chat our ministry links and we would love to hear from you. Amen. Yep. Amen. You, well said, Chris. I, I love what you were saying at the end. It was powerful. Uh, the scripture that came to mind when you were sharing that is Galatians 6, 9. Do not <laughs> and well-doing for at the appointed time you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up and faint so i just want to encourage you i feel like there's people here you're about to give up and god's saying hold on i'm at work in your situation and i will bring you through this at the appointed time so stick in there by faith trust god i believe you're hearing this message for a reason and um uh, we're just grateful i pray this was an encouraging message for you so we're going to uh, close out in prayer and just uh, pray a prayer of encouragement over each one of you. Father, we just thank you for this incredible opportunity to come before you and talk about the wait, how to wait well, um, how to trust you and not get a bad attitude. Father, the good news with you is that we can take the test over again uh, through the blood and the grace uh, of Christ. And so, Lord, help us to pass the test. Help us to learn what you want us to learn so that we can move forward and not prolong seasons of waiting. We know there's an appointed time to wait. So Lord, help us to learn to wait well. Bring good people around us that can speak wisdom into our lives and, and mature us uh, through these seasons. God, I pray that for those that are wanting to quit and give up, I pray that you would blow new encouragement into the winds of their sails, their sails, and um, that you would um, give them water for their thirsty souls. May you encourage them and strengthen them. And may they know that they're not waiting alone, that you're in the boat with them. You're in the storm with them. We love you, God. It's an honor to serve you. Bless all those that hear this message in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Corey, where are you headed next? I'm actually headed to uh, the Midwest, Indiana. This week, I'm speaking at this ministry group called Arise Ministries over the weekend. And then I'll, I, I'll be up in Indiana for a week doing various ministry stuff. So, yep, I leave tomorrow. So oh, Awesome. Yeah. I am headed, if you're in the Maryland, Baltimore, north, south, east, west, I'm going to be speaking for Single Faith. You can go to singlefaith.com and you can find out um, what they're doing. It might be singlefaith.org. Sorry, I'm just off the top of my head, but you'll figure it out. Wonderful ministry reaches several states. They've got meetup groups everywhere. And so I'm going to be teaching. We're going to have a great day in the afternoon. It's an afternoon to evening because uh, we're going to have dinner out but together and then we're going to have a bonfire. So definitely special. Please come to that. Um, and also, I've got a couple cruises coming up. And uh, if you're single and you would love to do a Christmas cruise, love for you to come and be a part of that. It's Dominican Republic in December. And then next summer, married or single, Corey, uh, oh. we're doing, oh, wow. yeah, a, a cruise to Alaska. Wow. And, uh, and so uh, RK Praise, Russell and Christy Johnson are going to be teaching a marriage track. I'll be doing singles. But it is on, if it's on your bucket list, this is the time to go because we're going to have so much fun. You'll be with people who love the Lord. And it's a lot easier to go with a group. You can do stuff on your own, but yet you'll have a group of people to be with as well. And I've been on this cruise before, so I kind of know a little bit about it. 
and it helps we have somebody who has a little experience um, on the ship. But uh, but please go to our websites. We love you to pray. Um, I have a prayer team. Need your prayers for what I do. Corey needs your prayers for what he does. Um, and if you want to support us, we appreciate your support uh, financially as well as just an encouragement. Get, drop us a line. And if you accepted Christ, Corey, if they if they want to know more about how to accept Christ, what would you tell them? I would say number one is we all need God. Every one of us is born with a uh, a disease called sin. And the Bible says for the wages of sin is death, spiritual separation from God forever. And every one of us is guilty. There's no one righteous, not even one. And so if God's stirring your heart, this, like you want to know the God of all creation and why you exist. The first step to that is to deal with the sin condition in your heart. And God settled that condition, that sin condition by sending his son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. He lived a sinless life and he took the weight of all your sin and my sin and the sin of the world and he put it on himself at the cross and he died a horrible uh, sinner's death, but he didn't sin. He took the sin of the world and put it on himself. And, um, and then he died on a cross and he rose again. And, um, and so when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, Say, I want to be forgiven of my sin and know for certainty I'm right with God and I can spend forever with God in heaven. You simply reach out to God in your heart and say, I want Jesus's payment for my sin. I believe he died for me. You reach out and you receive that free gift by faith. Receive it by faith. Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me. I believe you've forgiven me. If you pray that simple prayer, Jesus came to live inside and you, the Bible says you got born again. You got a new DNA, the DNA of God's eternal family. And your name is written forever in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says, and you're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. But the good news is God wants you to discover why he put you on this earth too, that he made you for a purpose. And as you start walking with God in this relationship, he wants you to discover why he put you here so that you can bear fruit that will last for all eternity in heaven. Amen. Amen. Well, Corey, thank you so much for uh, joining, or I would say joining me tonight. I joined you tonight. Thank you for this, uh, another overcomer event. We'll yep. be scheduling another one until God tells us to stop. Yep. And uh, so we'd love to see you at any of our events and, and meet you in person. And, uh, but we are also available. Feel free to contact us if you have a question, you want to bring us to your city. Um, you know, we just want to help as well. And so thank you, everybody. Have a great uh, weekend. Do something yeah. fun for the Lord this weekend and and share with somebody this message about, you know, the weight is worthy uh, when it's for God. Amen. Yeah, it's worth it. Chris, it's always wonderful uh, spending time with you and, and encouraging people with you. You're, you're a joy. Blessings on you and blessings, everybody. Uh, have an amazing weekend. God bless. Mm -hmm.